In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. Hello everyone, it's Father Stephen, and this is Orthodox Survival Course, Class 53, Part 1. I entitled this, The Great Imposture. This whole section of our course we're going to call The Great Imposture, I-M-P-O-S-T-U-R-E, The Great Fake. <laughs> Invasion of the Body Snatchers, and Antonio Gramsci. I entitled this new section of our history course, The Great Imposture. I could have called it The Great Revolution, but the revolutionary stage of this thing, what earlier in our course I called the Age of Revolution, is for practical purposes over. It has, for now at least, succeeded. The bad guys, you know, for practical purposes have won. And we who oppose this revolution are now forced to ourselves to be the revolutionaries, albeit counter-revolutionaries. I could have called it the Great Conspiracy, but conspiracy has by now become such a controverted and overused term that it has also become nearly useless, though I plan to discuss this term before I finish today. I settled on the term imposture because imposture describes well what is going on, which is this. The revolution, or the conspiracy, if you prefer, has now succeeded, and the former revolutionaries, who are now the people in charge, have constructed a vast imposture, a great fake, a new order that pretends to be the legitimate order, and even clothes itself with the legitimacy of the old order, but which in fact is an engine of disorder a nihilistic mocking substitution for legitimate order, a constantly mutating phony order that is not order, that in fact is a pandemonium of chaos, a lunatic juggernaut driving itself and us with satanic energy into an endless process of centrifugal spiritual fragmentation, a measureless mess whose messiness the people in charge use to justify their imposing greater and greater outward control. And as they squeeze harder and harder, guess what? The mess gets worse and worse. The only constant in this whole thing, the only constant is their will to power. Their God is the devil. And they worship his nothingness, as he worships his own nothingness, but can never be happy and they can never be happy. Because he and they cannot really destroy anything God has created, including themselves. Their God is the devil, and they worship his nothingness as he worships his own nothingness, but he can never be happy because he cannot really destroy anything God has created, including himself. Because God's creation, God's order, is so vast, one human heart, after all, is larger than the entire physical universe. These people could go on for a long time trying to destroy it, and they will go on until God puts an end to it, and he will put an end to it. We have only to be loyal to him in the time that we have been given. Here's an image to help us understand what's going on here. In the 1950s science fiction movie Invasion of the Body Snatchers, aliens from outer space try to take over the world by inhabiting the bodies of real human beings. They basically they kill the person, then they, 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 then they animate his body. Okay. <clears throat> Their great power lies in the affection and reverence that people naturally feel for their friends and relatives. When the person in front of you looks like Uncle Joe, it's really hard to accept that he's not really Uncle Joe, that Uncle Joe is dead but his body is being animated by an evil thing that wants to destroy you. The power of today's imposters lies in the very affection, reverence, loyalty, and love people rightly have for their traditional, reliable institutions and the leaders who are the face of those institutions, church, government, education, medicine, science, and so forth. When the people in front of you bear the revered titles of patriarch or bishop or president or governor or professor or doctor or priest and so forth, and you naturally want to trust them, 
you naturally want to follow them. It's really hard to believe that what you are looking at are merely the old shells of those authorities, now inhabited by some evil thing that wants to destroy you. Now, obviously, I'm not saying that actual aliens from space are inhabiting the, your, your local priest or, or the, the governor of my state and so forth, except insofar as demons are inhabiting them, right, and telling them what to do, and also insofar as the entire institution has been hollowed out from the inside and replaced by anti things that are anti-institution that are against the very purpose which the institution was set up okay that's the that's the point of my using this image okay don't go telling people father stephen said the aliens from out of space are living inside of governor whitmer okay <laughs> in, in michigan all right i hope nobody thinks is i mean i hope nobody is taking what i'm saying it that crudely right but certainly the demons are inhabiting these people and these people are fakes they're imposters who are inhabiting the titles and the power and the authority and the prestige and the the very buildings the infrastructure and the wealth uh the generations accumulated to build these institutions okay it looks like the real american government eh, it's maybe five percent ten percent is left right it looks like the the old patriarchates of the orthodox church eh, maybe five ten percent is left you know of people who are really uh at the top who really still mean to do the right thing okay so this in, this huge fake this this incredibly clever fake uh ref, is the diabolic genius uh, uh the, the, the 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 is arises from the diabolic genius of what in political theory is called the gramscian method or the long march through the institutions now what's this gramscian method antonio gramsci who uh, lived from 1891 to 1937. He was a Marxist, uh, obviously an Italian, who was a Marxist theorist who advocated, instead of violent overthrow of the old Christian order in Europe, he advocated a gradual, quiet takeover, gradual, quiet takeover, in which instead of destroying the old institutions violently, you know, instead of not Molotov cocktails at police stations, right, and not blowing up, uh, the king's palace. Instead of that, the revolutionaries would gradually, by a long and patient process, place their men in higher and higher and more and more positions of authority within the institutions. This kind of revolution, he argued, would be both less visible and therefore less effectively opposed, and its results would be permanent and predictable, unlike violent revolution which of its nature is unstable and unpredictable, as war by its nature is unpredictable. Right? So let's give an example of this. How do, uh, there's a lady named Bella Dodd. Look up Bella Dodd, B-E-L-L-A-D-O-D-D, -D, who was an American communist who repented and left the Communist Party. She converted to Catholicism back in the 1940s or 50s. And she testified when um, Senator McCarthy... Uh, was running his investigations in the 50s, she testified that she had personally placed hundreds, if not thousands, of homosexuals in Catholic seminaries. Right, And these men would become ordained, they'd rise, become the... and and they'd be promoted to be the bishops and so forth, and so you ended up with the what appears to be the auto-demolition of the Roman Catholic Church that has occurred since the 1960s. Okay, that's just one example. Okay. This is done throughout the institutions of of the world, and I mean, for us Orthodox, it's it's so obvious that the you know the obvious example of this is what is the creation of the Moscow Patriarchate. But this, it isn't just the Moscow Patriarchate; it's it's all of them that that um, agents, fakes, whatever you want to call imposters, whatever you want, whatever you want to call them, have been placed uh within the institution at the top of the institution this has gone on throughout the world it's gone on in every in governments throughout the world especially the governments of the most important countries and at the tops of the historic churches now as it turns out we have in this age of revolution which began with the french revolution we have been suffering from both methods right the violent method and the gradual method spasmodic bouts of enormous violence and bloodshed the french revolution the napoleonic wars the American Civil War, 
or World War I, the Bolshevik and other communist revolutions, the, the Bolshevik revolution during World War I, the other communist takeovers that occurred after World War II, World War II itself, right? These are vast, orchestrated, nihilistic orgies of physical destruction. But these uh, vast orgies of physical destruction have alternated and also have gone side by side with the quiet, steady placement of nihilists in all of the time-hallowed positions of greatest power. I'm going to say that again. All these wars, these violent revolutions and world wars and so forth have gone on side by side with the other process, the quiet, steady placement of nihilists, right? These devil worshippers, these communists, these destroyers, whatever you want to call them. The steady placement of these nihilists in the all of the time-hallowed positions of the greatest power, okay? These people are not completely in charge, obviously. Only God is completely in charge. And even in the visible human sphere, there are still localized centers of legitimate authority. There are still good guys out there, right? There are localized centers of legitimate authority, or there are people who go rogue on the establishment and, and become somehow become a senator or a president or a bishop or whatever. Of course, then, then they go wild and they try to destroy them, right? So even, even in the visible human sphere, they're still good guys, right? They're localized centers of legitimate authority, and legitimate meaning truly moral people who are trying to live up to what the uh, institution is really, the church or the state is really, a, or, the, or the business or whatever is really about, right? They're trying to carry on, they're trying to do their best. But at the top levels, and the, to the highest or top levels, you don't even know who these people are, right? They're the people who, who pull the strings, right? At the top levels, the body snatchers are firmly in place. They're firmly in place. If they are, if you, if they're called the World something, right? The World Health Organization, the World Trade Organization, um, the United Nations, you can, with complete confidence, for all practical purposes, act on the working assumption that they are up to no good. And and furthermore, they're guided with diabolic wisdom by actual diabolic intelligences. That they're in touch with demons, and the demons are telling them what to do. Okay. You have, say, a 99% assurance this is the case with things like World Health or World Trade, World Bank, and, and International Monetary Fund, stuff like that, okay, Bill Gates Foundation, you know, things like that, okay. Now, if it's the national something, the national, Medi you know, the American Medical Association, the National Bar Association, and so forth, you have, a say, a 75% assurance, <laughs> right, that's just demons at work, right, and so forth on down, right. Obviously, I don't mean these numbers literally. Okay, you get the idea. Okay, I don't mean to say that this applies only to the government. It applies to the media, the banks, corporations, universities, so forth as well. Remember, the government really is only a shell of what it used to be. Government, so-called government, is really a face or uh, an interface that that private concerns, to be polite, to use a euphemism, private concerns are using to um, control and, and dominate everybody. Okay. So this applies to all the institutions, media, banks, corporations, universities, and unfortunately to most of the historic institutions of the church. So the bigger and more prestigious it is, whatever it is, whatever institution you're talking about, the bigger and more prestigious it is, the more likely it is that evil people are definitely in charge. Okay, They've been put in charge. That's the nature of this Gramscian revolution. Part two, the, tahik, the katechon has been taken away, the katechon has been taken away. Earlier in our course, we have referred more than once to the consensus of the Holy Fathers regarding the words of St. Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Here is the entire chapter. I'm going to read it for you. So you may see the key term in its context. This key term is the Greek word katechon. Here's the reading. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand, that no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what restraineth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, 
only he who now restraineth will, will restrain until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned, who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. The end of the reading. The key term here is to be found in verses 6 and 7. In verse 6, it is to to, that's the, the Greek um, definite article, meaning the in the neuter gender. And katekon, kappa, alpha, tav, epsilon, hi, omicron, ni, the omicron, it's the neuter participle. <coughs> that which restrains. Now, uh, those of you who read the King James, it says let, but um, <laughs> that's confusing because because what what the author means is restrain because he's in other words, he's not letting it do something right that which restrains um, that which restrains and in verse seven it is o he that restrains o right uh, the masculine katekon with uh, an omega in the uh, ending uh, the masculine participle he that restrains, he that he the restraining one, okay, the restraining thing, the restraining one, the restraining man. The consensus of the ancient fathers is this: that which restrains, the thing uh, that restrains, is the lawful Christian government, considered as an institution, and he which restrains is the Christian emperor himself, the person of the emperor. Our most recent holy fathers including holy men of the Russian Church abroad, like St. John Maximovich, St. Philaret, the New Confessor of New York, Archbishop of Yerki and Archimandre Constantine of Jordanville, and that, that whole little choir of holy men, confessors, fathers of the 20th century. They all agree that the Russian Empire and that Tsar Martyr St. Nicholas correspond to these two restraining powers. And that therefore the reign of the demons preparatory to the period of Antichrist began with the Bolshevik Revolution. Now I'll say this again, it's extremely important. Okay? Many of us are from the Greek Old Calendar Church, many of us are from Russian Church abroad background. We've all been inculcated with this, you might say with our mother's milk. So this should be nothing new to us. And those of you who are not from our milieu, maybe this is new to you, but it's 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 very important. Okay. And I think almost everyone even those new to orthodoxy, you've probably heard of St. John Maximovich, at, at least, um, among these people. Okay. Our most recent Holy Fathers, including holy men of the Russian Church abroad, like St. John Maximovich, St. Philaret of New York, Archbishop of Yerki, Archimandre Constantine of Jordanville, and their, their company, their very impressive company, all agree that the Russian Empire and that Tsar Martyr St. Nicholas correspond to these two restraining powers, to katechon, or katekon, and that therefore the reign of the demons, which is preparatory to the period of Antichrist, began with the Bolshevik Revolution, 1917-1918. It's been going on for a hundred years now. Let's get real. All of the circumstantial evidence of historical events since that time, for the past hundred years, and all of the direct evidence of the often and openly publicized intentions of those who have seized the civil 
and ecclesiastical power since the martyric death of Tsar Nicholas, all of this evidence corroborates this application by our recent fathers of St. Paul's words to our time. I'm going to say this again. All of the circumstantial evidence of the historical events since the time of the Russian Revolution and all of the direct evidence of the often and openly publicized boasting intentions of those who have in fact seized the civil and ecclesiastical power since the martyric death of Tsar Nicholas. All of this evidence corroborates this application of St. Paul's words by our saints to our time. For an Orthodox teacher today, a bishop, a priest, a theologian, a writer, for an Orthodox teacher today, it is far more speculative, far more risky, dare one say, irresponsible, to ignore or to downplay this interpretation of the present situation than to teach it and to emphasize it. There are those who say, well, it's speculative, it's risky, it's uh, audacious to say uh, these things. It's the opposite. It's audacious and speculative and risky to ignore the teaching of our recent fathers and ignore the vast evidence of recent history and the published stated intentions of the people in charge. That's far more, more risky than to say, you know, I'm sorry, y'all, this is what's going on. This is not to say that we should hope confidently to apply each eschatological prophecy of Holy Scripture, especially in the apocalyptic literature, in a one-on-one -on -one correspondence to particular current events. Many have tried and failed. Okay, So people who oppose this basic understanding set up a straw man. They say, well, y'all are just like um, Hal Lindsey or Tex Mars or somebody, and, and you're just... You, you want to make a one-on-one -on -one correspondence between every new event that appears in the newspaper with something in the book of the Apocalypse. Okay, well, that's a straw man. That's not what we're talking about. Okay. But to grasp this overall understanding, to grasp this overall understanding that the spirit of Antichrist now dominates the public sphere and that actual forerunners of the Antichrist do hold the levers of earthly power to grasp this understanding is not speculative, it's not risky, and it's not diluted. At this point in our history, to reject this understanding is in fact the far less tenable position if we are to believe revealed truth, the guidance of the saints, the historical evidence, and common sense. Now I'm going to read this whole paragraph over again. This is not to say that we should hope confidently to apply each eschatological prophecy of Holy Scripture especially in the apocalyptic literature, in a one-on-one -on -one correspondence to particular current events. Many have tried and failed. But to grasp this overall understanding that the spirit of Antichrist now dominates the public sphere, that actual forerunners of the Antichrist do hold the levers of earthly power to a very great extent, to grasp this is not speculative, risky, or diluted. At this point in our history, to reject this understanding is in fact the far less tenable position if we are to believe, revealed truth, the guidance of the saints, the historical evidence, and common sense. Part 3. The Corona Chaos. A few thoughts now on the CC, the Corona Chaos. We have the official or establishment position on the topic, and we have various dissenting opinions. The official position, eerily and absurdly uniform throughout the world, regardless of location, regardless of uh, demographics, regardless of medical evidence, regardless, regardless of any evidence, okay? The official position, eerily and absurdly uniform throughout the world, is that this is an illness so deadly and so contagious that it requires the, that unrestricted power be given to those in authority to wreak an unprecedented destruction on the most basic forms of social relationships, human freedom, including religious freedom, and economic activity throughout the inhabited earth, and ironically, furthermore, to wreak destruction on the entire medical system and on our body's own immune systems. Okay? Now that by itself is so drastic and self-contradictory a claim as to be self-evidently absurd 
we are going to save you. In other words, by destroying you. One immediately calls to mind the Orwellian principle that Big Brother always uses, new speak, in which the meaning is always the opposite of the words. War is peace, evil is good, and so forth. Stay home, save lives. In fact, by staying home, you're destroying it. Everybody's destroying their immune system. So when they come out and they inject us with this vaccine, we're all going to get sick and die. Okay. When people talk like this, war is peace, evil is good, you know, stay home, save lives. When people talk like this, we may safely conclude they are up to no good. Now, the dissenters from the establishment do very widely. They vary widely. They're not all saying exactly the same thing, as dissenters always do. Because unlike the establishment, which by nature is highly controlled, the rebels are by nature a disorganized lot. But all of the dissenters agree on one thing, which is this, that quite apart from the question of the origin of the disease, which we need not determine, at least not for our purposes today, quite apart from the question of the origin of this disease, Regardless of its real potential for spreading and causing people to die, which is highly controverted, the usual suspects are using the disease as an excuse to establish, by means of threats and coercion, far-reaching, unprecedented control over the bodies and minds of the entire populations of the nations of the world. Viewed through an orthodox lens, this project obviously reeks of the spirit of Antichrist, and if you can't smell it, you are really not paying attention. Your, 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 your sense of smell has been destroyed, right? Viewed through an orthodox lens, this project obviously reeks of the spirit of Antichrist, the mind of Antichrist. It is obviously the Babel Tower project all over again. We don't need to know when the person of the Antichrist will show up in order to know when the mind of Antichrist, which expresses perfectly the mind of Satan, is at work. We don't need to know when the person of the Antichrist will show up in order to know when the mind of Antichrist, which expresses perfectly the mind of Satan, is at work. There have been many Antichrists since the beginning of the church, as testified by St. John the Theologian, look in 1 John, the first epistle of John 2.18. Our duty is to resist these Antichrists in every generation, not to beg be excused from the struggle because we cannot obtain scientific knowledge of the precise date of the second coming of Christ and thereby work backwards to calculate the time of the coming of the personal Antichrist in order to mark it on our social calendar. Whereas the straw man these people set up is to say, well, you know, we don't know the day or the hour and we don't know when Antichrist is coming, so stop talking about this stuff. Okay, that's a very poor argument. Our Lord said that we are to read the signs of the times and as any Orthodox Christian is required, it is, it's our duty to discern the spirit of Antichrist and to fight the agents of Antichrist in every generation in the time that we've been given. I'd like to make a, 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 f some final remarks about two terms, two, um, two insults, two ad hominems that are used to shut people up. Therefore, as an Orthodox pastor, God knoweth how, and also, God knoweth how, willy-nilly, a bumbling but well-meaning minor league internet voice, I have the responsibility to encourage all of you not to be silent when you see that there is devil's work in all this COVID-19 business. After prayer, counsel, and careful consideration, speak the truth as you see it. Do not let anyone discourage you by saying that you are a conspiracy theorist or that you are paranoid. These words are not arguments. They are just insults, and they don't prove anything. All it means is, I don't like you, shut up. Okay. Let's examine these two terms. Conspiracy. What's a conspiracy? A conspiracy has two elements. Concerted action by a group of people acting towards a common end, and secrecy. A conspiracy has two elements. Concerted action by a group of people acting towards a common end, and secrecy. Unless you believe that history is an utterly random series of unconnected events, that the great events of history were the result of atomistic individuals bumping into each other, an idea utterly at variance with sanity, an idea utterly at variance with all human experience and common sense, much less with the Christian philosophy of history, unless you believe such a nonsensical thing, you must accept that groups of people do get together to make things happen. 
Okay, that's one element. Okay, who can deny that? Now, as for secrecy, the plans of today's global elite have been laid out clearly and publicly in their own published books, articles, interviews, movies, broadcasts, and so forth. The entire array of communications media we have called the Great Stereopticon, at least for 100 years, if not more, it's all out there, published by mainstream publishing houses, you know, proclaimed to the whole world, okay, at least for 100 years. At this point in history, I fail to grasp how anybody can speak of this as a secret plan or as a uh, that you have to dig it up that you, you have to dig up this knowledge in obscure sources it's an open plan and a great deal of it is already openly accomplished nowadays the shoe is on the other foot it is those who oppose the theomachist authorities who are forced often to conspire to act in secret or it's we have to be the conspirators right we have to keep our heads down stay off the radar screen the Theomachists may parade their intentions in broad daylight. Okay, so so much for conspiracy. So it's it's a it, it, if you, you call these you call these people out and then you're calling conspiracy theorists. It's utterly absurd. Another term, paranoid. I get nervous when I hear anyone accusing anyone else of being paranoid. Paranoia, strictly speaking, is a diagnosable clinical condition. Paranoia is a diagnosable clinical condition, an actual psychosis. I realize that most people mean it in a careless fashion, meaning only to say that the person so categorized is simply overly fearful or, or suspicious. The problem, however, with the widespread careless habit of using such a powerful term to stigmatize another person's mental state is that it creates the social conditions in which a critical mass of people will go along with the authorities in identifying their opponents as being mentally ill and locking them up. The Soviets did this all the time. I mean, I, I knew people. When I was, I was a pastor in a Russian church in the 80s and 90s, I knew people that had, this had been done to. Okay. I am extremely grieved when I hear Orthodox Christians, and especially those in authority, stigmatize pious and intelligent Christians as paranoid simply for expressing a healthy skepticism of the intentions of civil authorities who do have a long track record of opposing the most fundamental goods of church, society, and family. I am extremely grieved when I hear Orthodox Christians, and especially those in authority, stigmatize pious and intelligent Christians as paranoid, simply for expressing a healthy skepticism of the intentions of civil authorities who have a long track record of opposing the most fundamental goods of church, society, and family. So much for paranoid. Conclusion, where to next? In our next class, we will return to the great holocaust of the Orthodox Christians and the suicide of Christian Europe, which began with World War I and the Bolshevik coup against the Imperial Russian government. Meanwhile, let us redouble our prayer and struggle for attentiveness. Don't just get upset, y'all. you got to pray. Be of good cheer, saith the Lord. I have overcome the world.